Good evening. I'm not going to say happy Sabbath because the Sabbath just the Sabbath just ended. But I'm going to say by God's grace we pray that you will have a blessed week that you start the week well and finish it well. Now let me mention as we start that the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 that all things work together. How many things work together? How many things? That means every day? That means that when you go to work, you go shopping, you go wherever you go, nothing happens by chance? Think about that. Small things. That means that everything that you do every day, small things, insignificant things that you don't even think about them. You just went grocery shopping. You just went to work or to school. Everything, every small insignificant thing that you do works together. And God uses them together. And people are waiting for big things. And they say, if God would give me a big opportunity, I will serve him. And God will never would give you a big opportunity before you are faithful in small opportunities. God wants you to develop character by being faithful in small daily things. As you are faithful in small things, God can give you bigger things. And as you are faithful in those, God can give you bigger things. If you don't serve in those things, you'll never get the big things. Let me, my father used to say to me, son, God called you for such a time like this. Where in the Bible it says you are called for such a time like this? Where? In the book of Esther. And I would say to my father, me? For what time? And he said, for a time like this. And I would say, when? And my father would say, today. I said, what do you mean? Today is no special day. He said, oh, yes, it is. Today, when you get out of your house, you say like Isaiah, here I am, send me. You say, Lord, here I am, open my eyes, so I see the people in need. Give me opportunities, open my eyes, so I am not so focused on myself, I am not so focused on my needs, that I am blind. That I open my eyes, that I see people who need a blessing, and forget myself, and serve others. And my father said, you are sent there for this person, for this time. If you don't use it, God is not going to give you another one. If you use it, God is going to give you another one, grow you, and then give you something bigger, and grow you as you use the opportunities to serve. And so my father used to tell me that. And so I was only four years old. Four years old. And what happened? Very interesting. We had rain, extreme rain. When I say extreme, it was so much rain, it rained day and night for a week. And the water became on the streets as big as in the middle of the doors of the cars. There, there, was, there was flooding. And so after the rain, the water started to go away, to recede, and it was smaller and smaller. But in some parts of the street, there was still a lot of water. In front of our gate, there was a sewer opening. Do you see it on the screen? Okay. The workers came because the water was still tall up to here in the street. And the workers got there and unclogged the sewer. And then the water started to go away. But still the water was at the level of the sewer. And the workers forgot to put the cap back to cover the sewer. They left it open. Now, I had a, a, a neighbor. His, his name was Sorin. This guy... I was four, he was five. I was slim, he was fat. This guy was big. This guy had so much power, and every time I would take food from home, he would grab me, hit me, take my food, and eat it. I said, hey, you ate enough, that's my food. He didn't care. And I said, I hate you. And my father would call me and say, no, you don't hate him. You love him. This is an opportunity to work with him. No, this is a crisis. He took my food. No, this is an opportunity to work with him. My father would give me other food. 
and then he would give me two sandwiches. Go to him, give him one, and you keep one. And work with him. Make him a friend. No, he's an enemy. <laughs> well, that day, he was running after me to take my food. I run outside. He runs after me. And I look back to see, is he catching up with me? When I look back, he's no more. He disappeared. I thought he was ruptured. He went to heaven. He was no more. I look carefully. He was behind me. He's no more. And then I hear blick, blick, blick. And I look in the sewer. He fell in the sewer. And he went under the water. And I look there. I said, Sorin, uh, he's no more. And then I see him coming up. I see only the hair above his head. How is the battery? Is the battery OK? So I see only the hair. And I try to pull him, but I could not reach. So it came in my mind in that second what my father said. All things, every day God gives you opportunities to serve. For such a time like this, you are called for today, for this place. Specifically, God put you there in this time, at this place, for a job. If you don't do it, you will never do anything else. God will never trust you. If you do it, God will give you another one and another one and grow you and develop you and use you to save people. So right away, I run back to the house and I scream to my mom, Mom, Sorin disappeared. And mom says, oh, come on. I said, Mom, he's in the sewer. She says, cannot be. The sewer has a lid. I said, no, he's in the sewer. My mom's screaming, running. She went to the gate. She looked and she saw his hair under the water, just, a, just at the level of the water. And my mom got on her tummy on the ground and she grabbed him by the hair and then she grabbed him by the, by the shoulder and she got him out and she gave him some, how you say, uh, CPR or however you call it, until he was spitting water and coughing, she brought him back to life. And my mom looked to me and said, son, if you didn't come that second, would have been too late. That's one incident. I could give you another one or another one or another one. For instance, I was preaching in Colorado. I was preaching in Champion Church in Colorado. After I finished preaching, it was warm, it was summer, it was 82, 83, 85 Fahrenheit, I don't know. That's probably around 30-some uh, Celsius, I don't know, more or less. And so after I preached, the head elder, who is also a captain, uh, a, a, on a pilot on an airline, Virgin, or I, I don't remember. I don't remember. Don't quote me there. I have no idea. Uh, I believe it was something with F. Frontier, Frontier Airlines or something. It doesn't matter. He was a pilot. The, the head elder says to me, Pastor, do you want to go up to see the mountains? I said, absolutely. He says, tomorrow morning, early, be ready. I'm going to come and pick you up. We took a walk around the church. I went to the hotel. I slept. Tomorrow morning, he came picking me up. And we went 85 degrees down. And we go higher and higher and higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. And, higher. and we get to 14,000 feet elevation, really way high in the mountains, and it is minus 25, and it is snowing, and the wind is extreme. The wind is so strong that when you get outside the car, the wind blows you down into the valley, and on the right side, you have mountain, and on the left side, you have steep, sharp. You could see going steep the mountain down, and and basically, you don't even sit down because of the clouds and the snow. And, and you need to hold the car because the storm can throw you off the road into the valley. And so we drive up the mountain and we drive. And there is a Honda Civic. Do you know what is a Honda Civic? Oh, yes. You know Honda Accord? What is a Honda Accord? A Honda Accord is the car of the disciples. Because the Bible says that you are all in one accord. Okay, so there is a Honda Civic. There is a Honda Civic right in front of us. And they stop on a shoulder to take pictures, and we stop behind them. When we stop behind them, 
two young Japanese girls come from the car speaking Japanese, probably around 19, 20. I assume they are tourists or students or something. And they were talking and I go to them and I say, how are you doing? And she turns back. She says something in Japanese to her colleague. And then she says to me in English, good. I said, are you visiting? Yes. Wonderful. I have a book for you. Ah, uh, we don't need books. I tried. <laughs> And then they get in the car, we get in the car. They move, drive a little, they stop at the next place. They get outside the car, we get outside. Take pictures, hey, I have a book for you. I don't need books. Okay. They get in the car, we get in the car. And as we follow the car, do you see the Honda Civic here? Right there parked. They get in the car and they leave. And as they leave, there are some rocks and the road goes to the right. And if you look carefully in the curb there, what do you see down on the asphalt shining? Ice. They get in the car and they go fast and they go through the ice and they take a right. And then we go and take a right. And when I take a right, the car is no more. And I say to the head elder, there was a Honda Civic in front of us. It's no longer. We stop the car and we sit down on the asphalt. We see the prints and we look down and we see the Honda Civic going down the mountain, tipping over into the valley. I didn't even have time to pray, Lord save them. The car was going down like this and then the car somehow got on the wheels, started to go like this then sideways. It tipped over, it tipped over, it hit a rock, it turned back on the wheels, it went like this, hit a rock and stopped halfway over the cliff and halfway on the ground. And from there, according to the police officer that came, there were 2,500 feet straight vertical fall. And the car stopped right there, balancing. The head elder and myself stopped the car. We got outside and started to go down, running down as fast as we could. We could not go too fast because it was steep going down. And so we went down. And as we go down, do you see how steep is there? As we go down, we get to the car. If you look there, far away on the road, do you see the red lights of the police and the firefighters and ambulance? Do you see the red lights? Okay, we go down. It took four hours or a little more, four hours and a half, until the police came, got all the way to that elevation. And so the head elder and I go down, and as we go down there, we find the car. And we try to open the front door and it doesn't work. And we managed to open the rear door and I try to pull them and the car is moving and I pull one of them and then we pull the other one. One has blood coming from her head. One has blood all over her face. She gets up and then she faints and drops down. We take her up and then the other one says, my passport, my passport. So I'm trying to reach her passport, but her passport is in the front. And when I reach, the car is moving. So I say to the header, grab my feet. <laughs> he grabs my feet and I get my hand and I reach the passport and she says, my cell phone too. Oh, come on, you can live without a cell phone. I grab her purse with her cell phone and she says, the other one, passport too, the other girl. I grab the other purse. I get it out, the cell phone is there, the passport is not there. I look back, the passport is there on the floor. How do I get it? I'm trying hard. Eventually I get the passport, get out and start taking them up. But it took about 40 minutes to get up because they could not walk. We had to kind of lift them up. We took our coats, put it on them so they don't freeze. Eventually in about 30, 40 minutes we are up, put them in our car and then I tell you, brother and sister, in 10, 15 minutes, you would freeze to death. That wind was terrible. And so we tried to call the police, but we had no signal. 
So we got up on the mountain, prayed. We got one bar, called the police. It took about four hours, four hours and a half until the ambulance, the police, the firefighters and the crane and everybody came. Meanwhile, they were in the car and we had no more room in the car. So we would take turns about, about the head elder, his wife, myself, my wife, and the lady who was a doctor. We would take turns who goes in the SUV, who would stay out and let the girls inside. Eventually, the police came, took them to the hospital, and then they pulled the car with a crane. We left. Anyway, the head elder went to hospital to visit them. And they said, you are real. <laughs> he said, yes, we thought you were angels sent by God. We thought you were angels sent by God to save us, and we refused the books, and we refused, and God yet saved us. And then I learned later that one of them was the daughter of one of the ministers, the minister of commerce or minister of something in Japan. But they said, we think. And the police told us, the police said, if you didn't think about stopping and looking, even if the car didn't fall, Within half an hour, they would have been dead because of the cold. And so I believe that nothing happens by chance. But all things work together. And if you are focused, oh, I got to get to work, and you don't look around, you miss opportunities. God didn't give you a job so you have a salary, so you have a good life. God gave you a job because he cares about your co-workers. Jesus died for those people, and if you don't reach them, their blood is going to be required from your hands. God didn't give you a house so you have a comfortable place to sleep, to live. God gave you a house because God cares about your for your neighbors and if you don't reach them they are going to say you knew it and you didn't tell me and their blood is going to be you will be responsible accountable for their loss or salvation you are responsible before god when you go shopping god says look around when you go driving god says look around God put you there every day for something specific. Let me just a little, just a little, just a little explain. So many times, so many times, I pray and I say, Lord, open my eyes today. If you put me today, if you are going to put me in a specific place for a specific job at a specific time, open my eyes. So I am not so focused on my plans to the degree that I ignore your plans. The Bible says in Jeremiah 29, I know the plans I have for you. Why is it plural? In, in, in Hebrew grammar, is not a future tense referring to the plan of salvation, second coming, uh-uh. It's a present continued tense. That means an ongoing situation. God says, I know the plans I have for you every day. Every day, God has a plan for you today. Are you curious to know God's plan for you? Or you are too busy with your own plan? Do you go to prayer and say, Lord, bless my plan? Or you go to prayer and say, Lord, show me your plan? In Ministry of Healing, the Spirit of Prophecy says, Jesus made no plans for himself. That's not because Jesus didn't have a brain, was unable to make a plan. But she says, he received the plans from the Father, period. And then she says, so should we. So should we come before him with your plans, present them, ready to fulfill them or to surrender and give them up. She says, according to his will, and then ask for his plan and fulfill his plan and trust that he will take care of our plan. Isn't that beautiful? How many times do you go and say, Lord, this is my to-do list, but I am ready to give it up. Would you please give me your to-do list? 
I am really picky. I have four lists. I have two for family and two for work. One is emergencies, one is other things that need to be done for work and the same for family. And every day I put my knee down and I present my list before the Lord. And then I say, Lord, if you want me to give them up, I'm going to just give them up. Leave it alone. Show me your list. Open my eyes. If you have somebody in need, make me a light. Make me salt. Make me a blessing. Help me reach somebody. Because you called me for such a time like this. Amen? Well, when you pray that prayer, be careful what you pray. Because God is going to answer that prayer. Okay? Be careful what you pray. For instance, I have a friend. And he, he told me, he said, Pavel, I've been an Adventist all my life. And my father was an Adventist. And he says, I've never done that. I said, you have not been an Adventist then. <laughs> he says, yeah, I'm an Adventist. I said, nope. An Adventist doesn't mean that you are in the books of the church. It means that you are a disciple. You are a follower of Jesus. If you are a follower of Jesus, you do what Jesus did. He is our example. Then you are an Adventist. And Jesus follow the Father's plans. So should you. He calls me, says, since I started to pray that way, things started to happen. I said, I don't believe it. Give me a story. If you don't have a story, then I don't believe it. And don't give me a story that happened 40 years ago when you get bap got baptized. Give me a story that happened last week. <laughs> because you should have a story every week. So he says, Pavel, I was driving Michigan. When you say Michigan, you say snow. It's like when you say Chicago, you say wind. In Chicago, the wind blows twice a year, six months from the east and six months from the west. In Michigan, it snows twice a year, one six months and another one time, another four months. <laughs> I'm exaggerating so you get the point. He says, I was driving on the interstate. It was snowing for a week, day and night. A lot of snow, mountains of snow. I remember when I was in Andrews, one time in the morning when I opened the door, the snow was as tall as the window from the apartment. And the car, I could not see. The, the car was covered. I had to dig around the car to be able to get into my car. That's a lot of snow. And so he said, Pavel, it was snowing for a week. I'm driving on the interstate and I am praying, Lord, here I am. I made myself available. Use me today. Open my eyes that I see people in need. Open my ears that I hear your voice. And he says, God spoke in my mind. And I, I, I was impressed to look right. And I turned my head and I looked right. And far away in the field, I see a bump, a white bump. So he told his wife, I'm not going to tell you his name or her name. He told his wife, honey, I saw a white bump far in the field. She says, honey, the whole field has bumps. And the whole field is white because it snowed. He says, no, 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 no. There was a bump different than the other bumps. She says, honey, you ate too much pizza last night. He turned around, drove back, next exit, turned around, came again. He saw the far away, 50, 60, 70 feet far away in the field. He parked the car on the shoulder, put the hazard lights, and then he goes through the snow. He gets there, he looks down, an old man, gray hair, white robe, white robe, covered in snow and here the man has something that says his name and then says alzheimer's the man left nursing home to go home and he forgot where is home and he fell down and he was snowed over so my friend took him in his arms ran to the car drove fast to the closest hospital and the doctor said he was almost dead you came in the last moment, you saved his life. And the doctors worked and saved the man. And then the doctors called the daughter of the man. The daughter came and says, I'm so glad you didn't hit him with a car. 
He says, how could I hit him with a car? He was not on the interstate. He was in the field, far away, covered with snow. She says, then how did you see him? If he was not in the road, he was in the field, far away, covered with snow. How did you see him? He says, well, if I tell you, you think I'm crazy. Tell me. He says, God spoke to me and said, look right. She says, you are crazy. <laughs> he says, I pray every morning, God, use me today. And God started to speak to me. Not every day, but every time there is a need, God impresses me. And, and I sense God's voice. And he said, God impressed me to look right. I looked right. I saw this strange bump. And I sensed strongly that God was speaking to me. So I go there and I found your father. And she says, I want to join your church. He says, you don't know anything about my church. Doesn't matter. I want to join your church. He says, why? We, we don't worship on Sunday. We worship on Saturday. She says, I don't care even if you worship on Tuesday. Whenever you worship, I worship. But we don't eat pork. Whatever you eat, I eat. I want to be baptized. He says, why? And she said, because all churches have theory. You have God. You have God's presence. You walk with God. You talk with God. And that's what I am looking for. Listen, folks, all things work together. Let me give you a story from the Bible to explain just a little about that. Do you remember Esther, the book of Esther? So I'm going to give you a little history lesson. The book of Esther. If you remember, Cyrus took Babylon. But Cyrus didn't take Babylon alone. In fact, it was... Darius, it was Darius that was Cyrus' son-in-law that took Babylon with his armies, and Cyrus did the plans and diverted the Euphrates River. They worked together, but Darius led the armies into the Babylon. And so Cyrus, he gave the first decree after the fall of Babylon, the first decree those from God's people should go back to Jerusalem. You remember that? Did they go or they didn't go? What does the Bible say? Most of them didn't go. Why? Well, well, well. They got camels and they got garage for the camel. And they got uh, uh, big screen TV with remotes. And they got big homes, and they work in the hospital in Babylon, and they work at the car garage, and they work at the, you follow me? They had jobs in Babylon. After 70 years of Babylon, imagine, they had jobs. Am I right? They had jobs. They had homes. This one works in construction. That one works in agriculture. That one works in the grocery store. That one teaches in the school. That one works in the hospital. They had jobs in Babylon. They had homes in Babylon. They had cars camels or horses or whatever, they had a life. Now to leave Babylon where you have a house and a job and you go back to Jerusalem and the road is dangerous and when you get there, your house was burned, your house, your temple is destroyed and you have to work hard to rebuild everything. Why would I do that? I can stay here. I have a job. It was not comfortable. When God calls you, it's not comfortable. Am I right? It's not comfortable. They didn't. And then the second decree came under the Rios Cambyses. And how many left? The Bible says very few. Most of them refused. And now between the second and the third decree that Artaxerxes gave, between the second and the third decree, something happened. Esther's story. The book of Esther happened. It was a death Decree. And the spirit of prophecy says, just as the death decree came there, at the end of time, there will be a parallel same death decree against God's people. Do you know that? The spirit of prophecy says clearly, clearly, the same death decree that came then is going to be pronounced against God's people before the second coming. It was a crisis. And that's where God called Esther for a time and a place and a job. So what happened? Very simple. Who is King Ahasuerus, Esther's husband, King 
Xerxes says history. So Darius was Cyrus' son-in-law. Xerxes or Ahasuerus, that is Esther's husband, is Darius' son. You follow me? Is the son of Darius or Darius or however you call him. And then after him, after the death decree, you have Artaxerxes Longimanus that gave the third decree in 457. That year, 457, is where the prophecies start. How many days and nights? What prophecy? The biggest prophecy. 2,300. And the prophecy is divided into part of it refers to, to Messiah. I mean, a little part to the Jewish people, and then a bigger chunk to Messiah, and predicts exactly, if you start from 457, it predicts exactly when Jesus will be baptized, when Jesus will be crucified, and when, when the gospel is going to be taken from the Jewish people, given to the Gentiles. Do you remember? Yes? No? Uh, do this so I know that you are awake, you don't sleep. Good, good. And so this is the greatest prophecy, the longest prophecy. And then it goes forward to the, to the, what is pre, the, the, the long part of the prophecy? It, exactly, investigative judgment. When, okay, so we know this part. But so what happened? What happened? Very simple. The king, the history says, the king was in war with Greece. And the king had a meeting with the men of war and the other princes. And they talked, how can we overcome Greece? He sent, the history says, his soldiers to build a bridge so they could attack that way. And he gave them a short time to finish the bridge. And because they were one day late, he executed them. He was not a kind king. He executed his soldiers they didn't finish the bridge in time because they were one day late. And so he gets his counselors and they have a meeting. How can we, how can we go against Greece? What should we do? And after they plan the war, they have a party and they bring wine and they drink and they get drunk and they, you know, crazy. And he says, bring the queen. What was her name? Vashti. She was beautiful. Bring the queen to dance in front of everybody. And she said, it's not decent. I'm not going to go. And she risked her life to stand for principles. So the queen didn't come. The king loved her, so he didn't want to kill her. But he divorced her. And he was looking for a different queen. OK? You know the story so far? Yes? OK. Some of you know. The others? OK. And so they gathered from the capital called Susa, okay? They gathered all the most beautiful girls, and among them was taken also who? Hadassah. That means beautiful shrub or beautiful flower. And her, if you remember, her cousin, her cousin, what? Exactly, thank you. Her cousin Mordecai, what did he do? He changed her name and he named her. That means, means star, but the Assyrians had Esther that means Ishtar, that was the goddess of love and the goddess of war. And so, as we move on, as we move on, God allowed Esther to be there in that location, in that time, for a specific job. You are not here just because you are here. God put you here in this time, in this location, for a job. And God has a job for everybody. And God says, I know the plans I have for you. God knows the plans he has for you. The problem is that do you know the plan he has for you? Do you care to know the plan that God has for you? Or your plans are more important than God's plans? And then you want a blessing for your plan, and you'll never get a blessing because you don't follow God's plan. And so she was put there for a plan, for a plan. Now, 
as you think about it, she was a slave, am I right? From a conquered nation, she was a foreigner. She was not a citizen. She was a foreigner in a foreign country. She was a slave. She was a woman. In that time, history says that women had no rights. They could not even be used as witnesses in the court of law. They were not allowed to vote. They had no rights. She was a woman, no rights. She was a slave. She was young. And she was orphan. What are the chances that she would be the queen? Zero. It's like Joseph. He's a slave. He's in prison. What are the chances that, that Joseph would be the prime minister of Egypt? Zero. Don't you ever say, oh, God cannot use me because I am nobody. If God took Joseph from prison and the slave in a foreign land and put him prime minister, God can use you. Listen about it. Think about, if God used a donkey, he can use you. Am I right? And if you don't do it, the Bible says, the stones, the rocks will do it, but you'll pay for it. God didn't reject Israel because they were weak and sinful. God rejected Israel because they refused to do their job. The Spirit of Prophecy says that they were called to be a light to all the nations. Abraham was called to be a blessing to Israel or to all nations. All, their house was supposed to be a house of prayer to Israel or to all nations. What did they do? They isolated themselves. Exodus chapter 25 says, you are a kingdom of priests, a generation of priests. And the Spirit of Christ says, to be a light to the whole world, to show the world God's love so they have a chance to be saved because God loves people. God loves people. And they were called with a mission. And they refused to do the mission. I remember, you probably heard me saying the story. I remember when I was 17, I was elected to be the choir director. Man, I was like a turkey. I, I could not, I was like swelling, you know. Oh, I am the choir director. And I prepared four months. Youth choir, men choir, women choir, big choir, orchestra, quartet, solo, poetry, drama, the best Christmas program in the history of the mankind. Or I thought so. And then we had for Christmas the program that I prepared. And people applauded, and I was like. And then I go home and say to my father, Did you enjoy the program? And my father, cool, says, What program? Where have you been? The Christmas program. He says, Ah, ah, okay. He says, son, who prepared the program? Oh, I want you to say me. But I knew better than that when I talked to my dad. So I said, we prepared the program? He said, who is we? I said, the church? Ah. And who listened to the program? I said, we? He says, who? The church? And my father says, son, if you have a cow, and the cow gives milk, and then the cow drinks the milk, why do you have a cow? I said, what do you mean? He said, son, God didn't call you to do church for the church. God called you to do church for the lost. You don't do agriculture in the barn. You do agriculture in the field and bring the harvest in the barn. God didn't say, wait in the church. He said, go from Jerusalem to Judea. Go. God didn't say, stay. He said, go, because they will not come to you. You are supposed to go to them. Why do you pre prepare programs in the church? You prepare, you listen, and you applaud yourselves. Go and do mission, son. I was like, come on, man. I worked four months. <laughs> and he said, what if you would have worked four months outside? You understand? Israel refused, isolated themselves from the others, called the others unclean. And God took the mission from them 
and gave the mission to you. And the Bible verse from Exodus 25, you are a kingdom of priests, is repeated in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says, we, the new Israel, the spiritual Israel, we are a kingdom of priests. We have a mission. God called you for a time like this to reach your neighbor, and God will make you responsible. If you don't do it, you'll be responsible. And so Esther was chosen, and Esther was not somebody rich, was not somebody powerful, was not somebody influential, was not somebody educated. She was a slave. She was a woman. She was an a, a orphan. She was a foreigner. But God can use anybody who is fully committed. It says, the eyes of the Lord search over the earth. To find one who is fully committed to put him to save the nation. One. God can use a Moses. God can use a Joseph. God can use an Esther. God can use a little girl that is a servant in name in, in Naaman. You remember Naaman, the, 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 the Syrian captain of the army? God can use a little girl to save him, and then no more war with Israel. God can use anybody if you fully commit and follow God's plan. Because it's not about you. It's about him. It's not about your power. It's about his power. It's not about what you know. It's about what he knows. There is no limit to what God can do to a committed person. We limit God because we are too selfish or lack faith. God gave Israel the promised land without even fighting. They just walked around the wall. God gave Gideon victory without fighting. God gave Jehoshaphat victory without fighting. They go to war. They put the choir in front of the army. They sing hallelujah, and the enemy is dead. God can give you victory if you fully trust in him and do the job that he called you to do. The reason God cannot work is not because God lost his power. It's because we don't seek his plan for us. And so, going back, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. God put Esther there for a job. Not that she is a queen and she has a nice dress and she has a nice car and she has a comfortable, hey, I'm the queen. I'm going to have a comfortable life. God put there not for a comfortable life, but for a job. God put you here not for a comfortable life, but for a job. Esther could have said, ah, oh, I am a woman. She didn't say that. Now think about it. No, we are not called because we are good. We are called just as we are. Called just because we love God and we are willing to make ourselves available and serve. We are ready to surrender and trust in him that he will use us. You know this Bible verse, for the eyes of the Lord range through the earth. Looking for those fully committed. There is no limit, no limit, literally no limit to the usefulness of one who sacrifices self and makes room for the working of the Holy Spirit and fully consecrates himself to the service of God. So, so we remember what happened. You know the story. Let's go a little through, through, the, through, through what happened. <clears throat> always, keep in mind, always, when God starts working, things go bad. If God doesn't work, things go okay. When things go bad, it means that God is working. Am I right? But let me explain. When God told Joseph, I'm going to put you over your family, what happened to Joseph? He got in prison. God said to Moses, you are going to deliver my people. What happened to Moses? He got behind sheep. Am I right? When God starts working, the reason people don't get to be used is because they don't like to go through the fiery furnace. They like to be used without learning some lessons. God cannot use you before he breaks you. Did you hear what I said? All people of faith in the Bible suffered before they were used. Peter, Paul, you name it, all of them, Daniel, Jeremiah, all of them, Moses. Why? 
because we humans have a tendency to trust our wisdom instead of trusting God. And God wants to teach you in order to use you to fully surrender, to surrender your plans, your will, your wisdom, everything, and trust only in him and do whatever he says. And we never do that. And then God has to allow us to go through some situations until we learn humbleness, we learn dependence, we learn obedience, we learn faith, so he could use us. Number two, when God calls you to serve, Satan, not only that God is teaching you some lessons to prepare you. How long did it take for Moses to learn the lessons? 40 years, brother. If God calls you, you may have to suffer 40 years. But not only that God is teaching you in order to prepare you for the call, but Satan attacks you too because he doesn't want you to serve. That's not the time when you suffer to give up. That's the time to pray more and to learn the lesson. Because all things happen for a purpose. If you go through a, a crisis, if you go through some suffering, if all things work together, if it didn't happen, you don't say, Lord, I am sick, please heal me. You say, Lord, if you didn't want it to happen, it would not happen. Am I right? God is in control. God would say, enough. As he told Satan, you can touch Job's family, you can touch Job's house, but you cannot touch, you can touch his health, but you cannot touch his life. God put the limits. If God allowed it, then you need it. Why do you say, God, please remove it? Didn't you pray one hour ago, Lord, give me faith. How do you learn faith if you don't go through a crisis? How can you learn to trust in God if you don't need to trust? You need to go through a crisis to exercise faith. Lord, give me patience. And then your boss bothers you. Lord, please do something with my boss. Didn't you pray for patience? If nobody bothers you, how can you be patient? When you pray, Lord, grow me, you actually don't know what you pray. You say, Lord, give me a crisis so I grow. Because that's how we grow, through the fiery furnace. And because we don't like crisis, we never learn our lessons, we never grow, and we are never used. We just want to be used without any suffering, without any growing, without any lessons. And we say, Lord, would you solve my problem? Instead of saying, Lord, would you help me learn my lesson and grow to this problem so I pass the class, so I don't have to repeat the class? And so God allowed these people to go through some lessons to develop them. The reason very few people are used is because very few people are willing to learn through suffering. Ellen White says that through suffering, character is grown, purified, matured, prepared. Character is developed. That's the reason we have very little character today. Nobody wants to suffer. Everybody wants blessings. Nobody says, Lord, would you give me some suffering, please? <laughs> And so, all things, every day, including crisis, have a reason. Don't run away from them. Brothers say, I rejoice even in my suffering. I rejoice always. Amen? When you go through suffering, say, rejoice always. Uh, am I? You know the song? And again, I say rejoice. So, going back. When God called Esther... The suffering and the crisis started. What happened? Haman, Haman was called to be the advisor, the prime minister of the king. And Haman was a proud ma man. And Haman wanted the others to worship him. And everybody worships him but one. Who doesn't worship him? Mordecai. When everybody bows down, Mordecai is not jellyfish. He has a spine. He stands straight. It's always, always a matter of worship. Three young men, worship. Daniel with prayer, worship. Eleanor says, at the end time, it's going to be worship. Are you worshiping the beast or you are worshiping God? It's going to be a matter of worship. And Mordecai stands straight and he doesn't compromise to worship Haman. Haman gets angry and he goes to the king and the crisis comes and he passes a decree, not only that Mordecai should be killed, but 
all God's people to be killed. Tell me why. Do you know why? Who knows why? Who knows why? Why? Nobody says anything. Okay. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Who was Haman? The Bible says the son of Hamedata, the Agagite. What is that? The son of Hamedata, so he was an Amalekite. And Agagite, what was Agagite? Agagites were the kings, the royal blood of the Amalekites. Well, let me tell you something that you may know, you may not know. Something that you may know, you may not know. Very interesting. Amalekites, among all nations, were the single nation. The other nations had idols. But Amalekites were the single nation that they worshipped Satan face to face. Amalekites' religion was worshipping Satan, and they declared in their writings, we worship Satan. And they would take six babies, newborn babies, cut their heads every time they would worship, every like once so long time, six babies cut their heads, empty the brain, put herbs, start a fire, and go around the city with the heads of the babies as sacrifice for Satan. They would take young virgins, the most beautiful from the city, bring them to Satan's temple as prostitutes, and after that, sacrifice them, cut, uh, tie them, cut their heart, take their heart out, and eat it while beating, to sacrifice them to Satan. From them, Israel started to learn to burn their children. From them, they started to learn prostitution and all the bad crimes and, and sins. Amalekites, not only that they worshipped Satan, but this is very important. Amalekites had a mission, a mission as a nation. They said, we exist to eradicate God's people. We exist to, to destroy God's people why? So Messiah will not be born to destroy the plan of salvation. So there will be no salvation, no hope for the world. Their goal was to destroy God's people so Messiah will never be born. Amalekites had time of grace. Abraham lived next to them. And Abraham, according to the spirit of prophecy, preached to them. But they refused. Moreover, anybody among them who wanted to worship anything else except Satan, would be killed. And God told Israel to do what with the Amalekites? To destroy them as a symbol for the end of the world, that those who worship Satan will be destroyed forever. So God gave an order, and prophet Samuel comes to King Saul. You remember? And says... You are in war with Amalekites. Destroy them, everybody. Nothing, no sheep, no horses, no, nothing left over. They are a nation that worships Satan. Destroy them. And <coughs> King, King Saul, what did he do? Did he obey? What did he do? He kept the king and the queen to brag, and they would serve him. And he kept, kept some sheep and some gold and some this and that. And Samuel comes and says, what is that noise? He says, oh, I kept them for sacrifice. And Samuel said, bring them here. And then the Bible says something interesting. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Very interesting. The Bible says that King Agag, the Amalekite king, was brought to Samuel. But the Bible said three verses before that the king and the queen were captured. But now it says that only the king was brought before Samuel. What happened to the queen? The history says that the queen was pregnant and the queen didn't feel good. So she stayed in the tent. 
When the king Agag was brought before Samuel, Samuel killed him with a sword. The queen witnessed it, saw it, heard it. And the history says that she slowly ran behind the tent and she got a horse, a camel, something, and she ran and she escaped. <clears throat> and Haman is the great, 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 great grandson of that queen, of King Agag. And he's called Haman the Agagite. King Saul was from the family of Kish, from the tribe of Benjamin. Esther, the Bible says, is from the family of Kish, from the tribe of Benjamin. So what happens here? What happens here? If you watch carefully, <clears throat> what Saul was called to do, God called him for a job. He refused to do. He was rejected, lost, and then his follower, Esther, was his great, great, great granddaughter. She did his job. And so, <clears throat> I don't know if you see the slide because we need to move. Uh, we did only 20 slides out of 43, but we need to move. But Haman is the grandson of King Agag. Esther is the granddaughter of King Saul. King Saul is called to kill Agag and all the Amalekites. He doesn't do it. Esther now is called to do the job. When the death decree is passed, Mardokai comes to Esther and says, don't you think that you alone will escape? If you remain silent, if you remain silent, relief and deliverance will come from another place. But you and your family will perish. And who knows if you are not called to this position, not that you have a good life as a queen, but specifically for this time. If you do the job that God called you, you will be saved. If not, you and your family will perish. And who knows if God didn't call you for this time, for this job, for a specific plan. Go and gather all people. She said, she could have said, no, it's dangerous. Let me tell you the law. The law of the Medes and the Persians says that if you are not called and you go before the king, you die. And listen, if you go, but a woman, if I go, I die. And then the history says that if the king was alone, you may escape. But if the king was with the council, you were supposed to be killed. So it would not be a precedent to others to do the same. It would be an example so nobody breaks the law again. So Esther knew, I will die. But she is ready to sacrifice herself to do the job that God called her. And she says, and if I die, if I perish, I perish. If I perish, I perish. My friends, The Bible says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Listen carefully. For we are God's workmanship, created for, created for good works, which God has already prepared beforehand that you walk in them. God has prepared a job for you. Walk in it. You were called for a job already prepared. God knew you before you were born. God knew your days. God knew your sins. God knew your weaknesses. Nevertheless, he says, I called you. I set you aside. Do it. If you don't do it, you'll perish. If you do it, you'll be saved. Don't say, I am just a woman. I am just a child. When I was four, I was four, I was four. A brother from the union, Pastor Forai, preached in my church. And he says, God has a plan for you. 
God has called you, everyone, everyone who wants to be saved is called to serve. God has called you to serve. Do you know God's plan for you? Do you ask every day, Lord, what do you want me to do today? I was four. I listened to the sermon. The pastor finishes the sermon. I go outside the church. There is a big, 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 big apple tree right in front of the church with yellow, golden, delicious, big apples, old apple tree. I go under the apple tree and I say, Lord, you have a plan for everybody. The pastor said, for I know the plans I have for you. Do you have a plan for me? I'm only four. How can you use somebody small, four years old? You cannot use me. Take somebody big. And then I go to my father. And the father and the pastor and the union pastor and the other elder, they are talking. And I get in between them and say, Daddy, does Jesus have a plan for everybody? Yes. For children too? Yes. But I am four. Yeah, but God called Samuel when he was six. It's not about you. It's about God. It's not about your age or your power. It's about God. God can use anybody. God can use stones. I said, okay. How do I know God's plan? And he says, well, you pray. I said, okay. I run under the tree. I kneel down. Lord, please, I know I am a child. I am four. Would you tell me your plan? And listen, nothing. I go back to daddy. He said, he doesn't talk to children. <laughs> My father says, God talks to his word. Give me the Bible. My father says, you don't know how to read. You are four. Give me the Bible. You said that God talks through the word. Give me the Bible. I kneel down. Lord, would you please tell me your plan? And then I open the Bible. Put my finger somewhere in the Bible. Would you, daddy, read for me? He reads Jeremiah 1, verse 5, 6. Don't say I am a child because you will go for me. I said, okay, I will be a pastor. Bye. Do you do that every day, Lord? I know I am only a child. I know I am old. I know I am poor. I know I am uh, uneducated. I know I am uh, busy. Uh, but would you please, Lord, show me your plan for today? Because you put me here for a specific job in a specific time in a specific place. Do you do that? Or you just are there for comfort? You go to church, you sing, you go home, and that's it. That's the extent of your religion. You don't eat pork, you don't curse, you don't work on Sabbath. That's Pharisees did that. Pharisees kept Sabbath. You should keep Sabbath. But Pharisees did too. They didn't eat pork. Pharisees uh, returned tight. Pharisees ate tofu. Pharisees did everything we do. Unless you do your job. You are not a disciple. And so, God has called you for such a time like this. I want to try to close a little. The last message of mercy to be given to the world. It's a revelation of God's character. God's children are called to manifest God's glory. You know, you remember he says when the character of Christ will be reproducing his children, then the end will come. This message is supposed to be proclaimed in the power of the Spirit and to lighten the whole world. The message of Christ's righteousness is to be sound, to be proclaimed, to be preached from one end to the other end of the world. Then the end will come. God requires personal service at the hands of every single one that was called from the world to God's truth. No one is excused. He will accept nothing short. You must save souls. If you love God, you love people. Everyone who claims to be a servant is called to do service. As each day must be the last day. In fact, in the book of Acts, page 9, it says, The church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. It was organized for service. In Testimonies, volume 9, it says, those who are truly converted will have a passion for the lost. And then she says, if you don't have a passion for the lost, you may have been baptized, but you have never been converted. In Evangelism 355, those who are converted will save others in darkness. And so on and so forth. Another paragraph says, not everybody can be a missionary in a foreign land, but everybody is called to be a missionary among the neighbors. God called you for a job. To every household, to every school, to every parent, to every teacher, to every child that received the gospel. 
comes the question that came to Esther. Who knows if you have not been here, if you are not called here for such a time like this. We need to finish. I want to give you a story and we finish. I, I was in Czech Republic meeting with the division leaders for some meetings. I was speaking and then one of the division leaders comes to me and says, Pavel, you know what happened in Bergamo? I said, where is Bergamo? He said, well, Bergamo is in Italy next to Milan. I said, I've never been to Bergamo. I don't know what happened in Bergamo. He says, well, there is a small church. So and so, mostly elderly. There are a few middle aged, but they had no growth. But they listened to some seminars. They listened to some seminars and they understood that it's not about their power. It's not about their education. It's not about their resources. It's about God. Like Israel. Oh, we cannot take Jericho. They have a big army. It's not about how big the enemy army is. It's about God that said that he will be with you. And they understood that if two or three get together and pray, God will work. So these few people got together and started to pray. And they prayed every morning from 6 to 6.30. And that sacrifice, they would meet at the church and pray from 6 to 6.30. Today, tomorrow, a day, two days, a week, two weeks, a month. And then I do remember, because one of the ladies called me, Pastor, we've been praying for a month and no result. And the Lenoi says, when we stop praying because we don't see results, we limit God. We need to keep praying so God could keep working. So I told her, I said, you have been praying for a month and no results. I said, I went to school for a month and they didn't give me a degree. I said, keep praying, sister. Prayer is the breath of the soul. Keep breathing. Pray without ceasing. She says, how long? I said, forever and ever, amen. I said, keep praying until Jesus comes and keep working until Jesus comes. That's your call. She says, you mean that not only a month? I said, no, it's not me who I mean. It's the Bible who tells you that. She says, oh, okay. And they kept praying and kept praying. Two months, three months, six months. One morning, 6 a.m., the neighbor across the street knocks in the church door. What are you doing here? You used to come one day a week, Saturday. Now you come every day. I work night shift. When I come in the morning, I have no parking because you take all the street parking. What are you doing here every day? And they say, we pray. What? We pray. What are you praying for every day? For the community, for the city? You do? Yes. My wife has terminal cancer. The doctor sent her home. Gave her three months the most. Would you pray for my wife? I don't go to church because I don't like politics. But I do in my mind. I believe in prayer. Would you pray for my wife? They said, yeah. And the man from the division told me that the lady told him that they prayed, but they really didn't believe that a miracle would happen. They just prayed. Next week, the man comes with his wife, hand in hand, and says, I want to be baptized. And they say, why? We went to the doctor, and my wife is cancer-free. And that's, the doctor said, what did you do? I said, I don't know. I just know that that church is praying for my wife. And he says, we want to join your church. And he said, God put you here for me and my wife to save her life and to save our salvation. You are people of God. I want to join your church. Then this man told his neighbor, my wife is cancer free. The other neighbor says, my kids are in prison. Would they pray for my kids? So next morning, this man brings another man with him and says, would you pray for him? So they pray for him. Next day, another one. Next day, another one. Several months, I don't know, 10 months, one year, I don't know. Later, every morning, a long line going straight around the block, around the block. A long line of people from the city coming every day to be prayed for. My house shall be a house of prayer. And the whole city talking, the Adventist church is praying for us. And God is using them to bless and to heal and to comfort us.
People after accidents, people sick, people who need encouragement, people discouraged, people coming to be prayed and the Adventist church praying for them. And then they started to do Bible Expo and to do health seminar and to do this and that. And the church went from 30 or 40 to about 250 and then they had no more room and they planted another church and another church. Because they understood that is not about them. They got together and they said, Lord, show us what to do. And it took several months because God had to prepare them and God had to prepare the city and God was waiting for an opportunity when people would be more open to listen and so on and so forth. What if they would have kept going to church every Sabbath, sing Kumbaya, go home and that's it? You understand? What if all of you, all of you, do that? And you say, Lord, here I am. You call me for this time at the end of this earth history. I know I am nobody. I know I know nothing. I can do nothing. I don't deserve anything. But you said that you enable those that you call. You call me to serve. Please use me. Show me your plan for my life. Show me your plan for today. And then open your eyes and do that every day. God may not talk to you today because God doesn't talk the way people talk. People talk all the time and say nothing like politicians. God talks when he has something to say. But when God has a need, he's going to show you what to do. Amen? Would you make a decision that you will make yourself available every day, starting now. How many of you want to make that decision? Lord, here I am. Use me. Amen? Let's pray together. We don't finish the message because our time is up. You see, it's 9.20 a.m. That's the home time. <laughs> we don't finish the message. But you got the message. I can talk another two hours. You got the message. No more need. Let's pray together and make ourselves available. Let's pray. Father in heaven, what a privilege that you would use somebody like us to work with you and the angels to save precious people for eternity and eternity and eternity. They will be in heaven because you want to use us. Please help us to value people as you value people. Please help us to desire to know your plan for our everyday life. Please help us to make ourselves available for service every day. Here we are, Lord. We commit ourselves to serve you. Use us. We pray in Jesus' name and thank you for answering. Amen. God bless you.